Take your Bibles, if you would, turn to Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to finish up chapter 2 tonight. And move on to chapter 3. I used uh, Ephesians 2 in the message this morning. And um, it's probably because that's where uh, our hearts and minds have been in the last few Sundays. When, the, when you read something in the Bible and study like a book or a passage and so on, uh, it lingers, lingers in your heart, and um, sometimes things come up, and all of a sudden, there all those verses are that you had just been reading, and you're going, oh, wow, I just read that, and the Holy Spirit usually uh, is part of that, if not directly at that time, uh, at least uh, indirectly, giving you a general knowledge of the scriptures, general knowledge of certain favorite places you might like. Everybody has a favorite part of the Bible uh, that they like or a favorite chapter, favorite um, favorite uh, individual human author. Um, my, one of my favorites is probably John. I like the style that he writes in. It's different than Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's different even than Paul. And um, you ask yourself maybe why did God pick all these different men uh, to write the Bible? Why didn't God just, why didn't Jesus when he came down in front of all these thousands of people sit and write out all of his teachings and say, here you go. This is, this is what God said. I'm God. You do it or else. Um, I may not know the big, huge answer. But one of the answers is that in Paul, you have a part of who Christ is. You get to know Paul by his writings and the writing style that he has. And you get familiar with that and you can then see a picture of part of Christ. In John, you have another aspect of Christ. And you get familiar with John's writings and you look at Christ and you can see uh, that character or that, that person. Uh, Isaiah is different than Jeremiah in uh, content and in style. Um, Moses, as the lawgiver, is particularly concerned with facts. This is it. This is the beginning. Here's how the earth was created. This is exactly how it was done. He didn't embellish it any. He didn't uh, uh, try to use metaphor and symbols so that we would say, well, that's a metaphor, that's a symbol, it wasn't really six days. He gave just the facts because that's what a lawyer does, that's what a lawgiver does, uh, and so that's what he did. Um, he was also the first judge of Israel, so he, as a judge, is concerned with, let's keep it to exactly what God said. Uh, let's see here, I'm trying to think of somebody that's just different than all of these guys. Moses, who else? Solomon. Solomon in the Proverbs, the book of Ecclesiastes, the Song of Solomon. Um, and his writings there, he's, he's focused on wisdom. That's his general idea is wisdom and learning wisdom and, and so on. So every one of these men in the Bible had a different contribution the fact that they were different men and that they were scattered over thousands of years. Uh, we believe that the first person to actually take pen to paper and write the word of God would have been Job because he lived about the time of Abraham. And then after Job, it would have been Moses uh, who then writes uh, not only of the creation and all the things that happened before he was ever born, uh, he's writing not only of his life and the Israelites in the wilderness and everything like that, but then he writes about his own funeral. That's got to be weird. Um, so he does all that and, and um, that's what, and so from Job all the way to John. So what do we have here? About, Abraham was about 2,000 years before Christ. 
John was just after Christ, so yeah, am I right on that? Yeah. So a period of about 2,000 years, you have the entirety of the Bible written. And then you have um, the continuity of the Bible. 40 different men, 2,000 years, and yet they all say the same thing. That's not possible. There is no other book in history that's written that way. When Josephus, who was a Jewish scholar, set about to write the, the history, he did it as one man writing through, I don't know how many years of history he covered, but he is, sits alone and he writes all of this history that he's learned. And he's done a lot of research, he's talked to a lot of people, he's used whatever ancient documents he could get a hold of. And so it's no wonder that Josephus uh, and his writings represent one solid narrative of history or his viewpoint of history. And yet in this, in the Bible's case, you've got 40 men over 2000 years writing all about the exact same thing and not one of them was ever wrong in anything they wrote. The prophecies, and we know for a fact that the prophecies like in Isaiah concerning Christ and, and Psalms and so on concerning Christ, we know for a fact that they were written before Christ by way of the Dead Sea Scrolls. They dated the Dead Sea Scrolls to a time way before Christ ever even came to the earth. And yet those, you know, here you have the words that Jesus spoke. My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? They pierced my hands and feet. They part my garments among them and cast lots for my vesture. David got that 100% right. Never failed in it. So anyway, that, that's what amazes me about the Bible. All right, enough of that. Ephesians chapter 2. And we're going to start in, uh, let's see here. Uh-oh, uh my antivirus has expired. I'm very, very concerned about that. Ephesians chapter 2, let's pick it up in... Let's see here. We're trying to figure out where we left off last Sunday. Um, let's start in verse 12 and we'll work our way down. That at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ, there's our theme again, chapter 2, in Christ Jesus, ye who were sometimes were afar off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us. Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man. If you look, let me type that in here. That is what salvation is totally all about. New, what did I type? New one, new man. Three times. Ephesians 2.15, Ephesians 4.24, 4.24, Colossians 3.10. Colossians 3.10, it tells us the same thing as Ephesians tells us, that we have put on the new man. The new man is put on us, and it's also in us. It is who we are on the inside. It is what will survive the death of this body and be able to make it into heaven. And only that new man can go to heaven. The old man must die. He must rot. He must turn back to the earth from which he came and then be burnt up and melted with a fervent heat, uh, according to Second Peter. So, uh, back to... Verse 15, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, soul making peace. Verse 16, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby. You know, I didn't, I didn't spend a lot of time on that this morning, but uh, I'm going to ask you, 
what it means when it says having slain the enmity. Slain means killed. So what does it mean to be have, that he had the enmity slain? What does that mean? Yes. Very good. The Bible teaches us that Christ became sin. Who knew no sin. That's why when God instructs Moses to build a... a well, I don't know what the word I would use is. To make a similitude prophecy... Um, he tells him to make a bronze serpent and put it on a pole and stand it up in front of everybody so that whoever looked on that serpent, if they had been bitten by the fiery serpents, they would be healed instantly. And so people just had to, they either believed God or they didn't. And if you didn't believe God, you died because you said, well, that's foolishness. That's right. And what is the preaching of the cross? To them that perish. Foolishness. So people have a problem with the cross. Oh, that's not how it's done. You mean men can do whatever they want to and sin all they want to? Well, they do that anyway. That's all, Men already do that. We already do that. So yes, people sin. And God forgives them for nothing. Yep. And this is why... What we believe is an offense to people. They don't like it. People are offended. Jews are offended at the cross because it's not Jewish. The cross is not Jewish. The cross was a Roman Gentile form of death. Okay? And so they don't like it. They hate it to them. It's offensive. And for Paul to turn over to this, they're like, we're going to kill that guy. How dare he leave us and go over there to their side? So they hated him. But anyway, um, so Christ became sin who knew no sin. The Bible says in Colossians that uh, he took on the form of his enemies. Um, and I have a theory. Can I tell you my theory about that? Took on the form of his enemies. Okay. Um, we were reading in Sunday school this morning about the locust that are released out of the bottomless pit and they have stings on them so that automatically tells me it's related to the sting of death so this is this is one way God is punishing mankind for his sin is the sting of these locusts but one of the things that's mentioned about these locusts is that they have the face of a man and the hair of a woman now I know this doesn't fit the fundamental Baptist view of Christ. I don't care. I believe Christ was the Nazarite of all Nazarites. I believe that uh, men like Samuel, uh, John the Baptist, and others, especially the, uh, Samson, who were under a lifelong Nazarite vow, and the requirements for that was they were not to... Uh, have any fruit of the vine. They were not to eat grapes, raisins, drink grape juice or anything like that. They were, um, so Jesus, when he ate his cereal, just had to have the bran, but no raisins in it. Um, then um, we know that there was not to be a razor upon his head. So we know John the Baptist looked like that. We know, uh, and I've even <laughs> had a discussion one time with a guy and his dad heard me say that and he didn't like it because he said, well, the Bible says it's a sin for a man to have long hair. And I went, hold on a second. I know you want to think that, but that's not what it says. And if it was a sin, then even the Nazarite vow couldn't be done. And we can't say that God gave the Nazarite vow because clearly he did. Clearly God said, don't cut your hair. Let it grow. 
And so if God considered long hair on a man a sin, then God is guilty of making people sin. And I don't believe that. But it doesn't say it's a sin. It says it's a shame. And in that sense, I agree. Because one of the things we know Christ was doing was bearing our reproach and our shame. So, picture this now. Christ having the face of a man and the hair of a woman. On the cross. What's he doing? Destroying his enemies. He's making a show of them openly. The thorns on his head, the crown. That crown is the Antichrist. And it represents death ruling and sin ruling over us. Thorns were the picture of sin. They were the, the curse of sin. And yet Christ is wearing it to the cross. And what is it? So he's, he's like, he like jumped in the middle of all of his enemies and said, hey guys, it's me. And they all come and attack him. And all of a sudden, boom, he blows up and kills all of them. Only that he didn't blow up on the cross. Huh? Oh, okay. So I think that's just, that's my theory. Uh, and I have more that goes with that, but that's, that's a part of it. Um, so that's why you're right, Alicia. Um, in order to have the en enmity slain, the enmity is in Christ. So when Christ dies, they all die. Uh, and of such is Samson. Samson's a picture of that. He's a prophecy of it. Um, because Samson had his enemies where? Over his head. They were up on the roof of that temple. And uh, I bet whoever designed that temple probably went, you know, I probably should have spaced out those pillars a little bit more. Because Samson took them both, brought them, caved them in. 3,000 people died instantly in that. And they finally ended up digging Samson out from underneath all that rubble. And the Bible says that the enemies that he killed in his death were more than in his life. And that to me is it, it fits the cross perfectly. And what Samson said was, let me die with the Philistines. And in that, you have Christ who is destroying his enemies in his death. Now, uh, in verse uh, 17, the Bible says, And came and preached peace to you, which were afar off, and to them that were nigh. To me, that the Jews are nigh, the Gentiles are afar off. Verse 18, For through him we both have access by one Spirit unto the Father. Um, can't remember exactly where it, I think it's in Corinthians. Oh no, in Ephesians 4. If you look over in verse 4, there's one body, one spirit, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father uh, of all who is above all and through all and in you all. Uh, there's seven things here. One body, one spirit, uh, one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and uh, one God and Father of all who is above all. Um, seven things that are one. So back here in verse uh, 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. I'm going to, I'm going to uh, get into an issue tonight when we get into verse 3 concerning... A doctrine that um, a there are quite a few King James only churches um, hold to this doctrine. In fact, some of them have it even written into their church's doctrinal statement that if you don't believe this, you cannot ever be a member of their church. And um, I have nothing to say about that. That's their church. It's how they want to do it. If they want to do it that way, that's fine. Because um, we all know that church membership doesn't mean body of Christ membership. And you can be saved without being a member of their church. But anyway, that's, that's their viewpoint and they have a right to it. But I do not agree with it. In fact, I, I think not all of it is a, is a dangerous doctrine, but some, the way some treat it, it is. Because it, it leads people to believe that there's more than one gospel. And this verse here 
verse 18, for through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. One spirit, back over in chapter 4, is one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, one body, one spirit, one hope. There's one gospel. Period. The end. There are no other gospels. There is not a gospel for Noah. There's not a different gospel for Moses. There's not a different gospel for whatever. They even, they even have a gospel that predates Adam. Predates Genesis 1, 2. Okay? Genesis 1, 1, in the beginning God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void. They say there's a gap between Genesis 1, 1 and Genesis 1, 2. A gap of an untold amount of time where God created a heaven and an earth and it was perfect and it was inhabited by angels and it was all this beautiful, beautiful, happy land or nothing was wrong and then the devil got involved in it and he went bad and he ruined it all. And so God had to make it um, without form and void. I'm not, listen, I'll show you in Clarence Larkin's Dispensational Truth where he says that in those terms, close to those terms. Um, and they have absolutely zero scripture to back it up. None whatsoever. Uh, but that's what they believe. They believe that there, is, there was a whole world created between Genesis 1-1 and Genesis 1-2 and that it, the devil made it so bad and so evil that he had to make it uh, without form and void. And I'm like, that's not what it says. So when Clarence Larkin was looking at Genesis 1-2, he realized it didn't stay. The earth turned no, uh, uh, without form and void. And it doesn't say was or the earth became void and without form. It says the earth was without form and void. Was. From the moment God created it. And then God then began to shape it. On, on day one, day two, day three, he began to shape it, add things to it, make it what, into what he wanted. Um, but they even have a dispensation for that time period. And I don't know how exactly they had divided up, but they say there's going to be like seven different dispensations. Which means seven different Contrary Gospels. Nah. No, no, no. One Gospel, one Spirit that both the Jews and us have access to the Father. And I'll explain that more as we go along. Verse 19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now, starting in 19, verse 19, verse 20, 21 and 22, these verses are are all dealing with the church, uh, and I even have a note here in my Thompson Chain Reference Bible, the church, a spiritual temple. Uh, these, these last one, two, three, four verses of chapter two. So it says that number one, that we are fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Uh, if you just wanted uh, something to study, just... Type in this on your pure Bible search software, House of God. Okay, 90 times exactly, which is, to me is interesting. How old was Sarah when she, gave, when she brought forth the new man? The new man was Isaac. She's the old man because she's 90 years old. Uh, the phrase Holy Ghost is 90 times in the Bible. So it has to do with fruit bearing. And that's what a house is. Uh, a house is not just a physical building, but a house is um, a family and, and all of their generations. So Jesus was of the house of David. It didn't mean that he lived in the physical street address that David lived in, nor did he live in the house that David lived in while he was on the earth. He was of the family of King David. Okay, So that's what house means. When Jesus said, in my Father's house are many mansions, he's re I believe he's referring to both. Not, not just in my Father's dwelling place, there are many mansions, which does apply, but also uh, in my Father's house, the house of God, are many mansions. 
So Jesus being of the house of God, he also being of the, he's the son of God, and we all as sons of God are part of the house of God. We are born of the house of God. Uh, and this goes back to a time when your last name pretty much determined whether you were going to live in the rich people's side of town or the poor people's side of town. And if you had the wrong last name, you could not live on the good side of town. We don't, you know, we, we as Americans like to say that, you know, people can live anywhere they want to. And legally, they can. Okay? Anybody can live any place they want to in America. There is no rich section of, uh, let's say, Festus, where they don't want anybody making under a certain, you know, there's no law that says that. Uh, people will maybe act that way sometimes, but technically you can live wherever you want to. Um, uh, let's see here, where was it going with that? Oh, uh, but in times past, if you bore some man's name as your last name, and that man was a man of ill repute, there are just places you couldn't go, places you couldn't stay, places you couldn't live, uh, and people had it rough. Um, I never thought about this, but I was watching a video the other day on yoga. And of course, yoga comes from India. And before, before the British colonized India, because of Hinduism, the people of India did not believe in any form of charitable giving, helping someone out with a meal, being kind to neighbors and giving things to your neighbor if they had a need. They didn't believe in that. You know why? Because of reincarnation and karma. They believed in karma and that if, if a child, if a, uh, like those four orphans, in India, those four orphans would be doomed because their parents died and everybody around them said, well, karma did that to them. Therefore, we're not going to interfere with karma, and so we're going to let them starve to death. And they did. That's India. And it, there is a, if you've got a bill, over a billion people in India, there's still a lot of people who believe that way. It wasn't until the British came with Christian viewpoints, Christian morality, that they said, well, we're not going to, you know, all these children in the streets. What are they doing in the streets? You're letting them starve to death. You're letting them get diseases and have people abuse them. So they started building orphanages. And these people, these karma Indians were like, how dare you do that? It was an offense to them big time. Okay. And, and what gets me is karma now has been infused into American thinking. Even if people think it's a joke. But you've got people who say, well, I believe in karma. Well, if you do then, you're on your own. Nobody can give you a hand. Nobody can help you. You can't, you can't go to certain places. You can't be in certain areas. Uh, and that one uh, missionary that we had, uh, Sam Cotavaticani, he said that some of, these, some of these gangster types with money, they steal street children and take them to some temple out way out in the middle of nowhere to have them slaughtered and sacrificed for their sins. Oh, that burns me. Uh, but anyway, this phrase household of God, that's really what it meant. Is that you bore God's name? That means that you have rights and you have access to all the things that God promises. Uh, if you are not bearing God's name and you're not of the household of God, you don't have right to it. You do not have a right to it. Uh, verse 20. They're built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Uh, turn to Revelation. Let's see here. Chapter. Where 
is this? Mm -mm 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 -mm. Yeah, let's see here. But let's start in, um, I'm going to have to read down and find it. Um, but it talks about the, the foundation. Oh, oh, here we go. Verse 19 of chapter 21. Yeah. Let me see if it's anywhere before that. No. He's talking about the tw uh, 12 walls in verse 12. And it had a wall great and high and 12 gates. And at the gates, 12 angels. Uh, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel. So on the gates of Jerusalem, which is built four square, like a, pretty much like a cube, uh, it has four sides, three gates on each side. And then uh, over those gates, you have one of the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. Um, they are the gateway to the heavenly city. And then um, verse... Verse 16, the city lie four square. Um, you have the wall in verse 17, uh, 144 cubits, according to the measure of man, that is of the angel. And then you have verse 19, and the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. The first foundation was Jasper, the second Sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth Sardonyx, the sixth Sardius, the seventh Chrysolite, the eighth Beryl, ninth a Topaz, the tenth a Chrys... Chrysoprasus, the 11th, a jacinth, and the 12, an amethyst. That puts me in mind of the breastplate that Aaron, that Aaron the high priest, wore when he went in to uh, sprinkle the blood upon the mercy seat on the Day of Atonement. God said, put that breastplate on. It has 12 jewels in it, a different jewel for each of the spots. And over the jewel, a name of the tribe of Israel and God specifically said so that the names of the uh, children of Israel be on his heart when he go in to perform uh, the duties there on the Day of Atonement. And I love that. I absolutely love that because that to me is Christ on the cross who has the names of Israel on his heart while he's being the high priest in the sacrifice. And then uh, we, this is where we get the idea of a pearly gate. Verse 21, the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every several gate was one pearl. That is one big oyster. And the street of the city was pure gold and as it were transparent glass. And I saw no temple therein for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. Uh, let's see here. Where is it? Where, I must be missing it. Where it talks about the... Um, no, the, I thought the foundation stones am I wrong had the name of the there was like 12 stones and each one was the name of the 12 disciples 12 apostles maybe I'm maybe I've been making that up all these years uh, but anyway that's it, I know it does have 12 foundation stones I've read it somewhere I'm just not seeing it right now uh, but anyway um, that's to me that's what he's mentioning here back in Ephesians, are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets. What is that? Why is it apostles and prophets? Prophets are the Old Testament. You have uh, Moses the prophet, uh, Enoch the prophet, um, David the prophet, he prophesied, Solomon prophesied. You have the, the prophets there starting in Isaiah. The major prophets, they call them because their books are big. And the minor prophets, they call them because their books are little. Uh, but you have the, the writings of the prophets there in the Old Testament. And the apostles' writing is in the New Testament. Apostle is a New Testament office. It's a Gent it's Greek word. It's a Gentile office. So you have both of those as the foundation of this house of God. Which means, contrary to... Those, or I will say some, who hold a dispensational viewpoint, they do not believe that the Old Testament can be gleaned for doctrine. They do not believe that. They believe that the Old Testament was specifically for and only for Israel. 
And it has no real doctrinal application for us. In other words, I, according to them, you don't just read the Old Testament and think that its doctrines and precepts are for us in this day right now. And I don't agree with that. They even say things like, Noah was not saved by grace, he was saved by works, because he had to build the ark uh, in order to be saved. And actually, somebody mentioned that in Kenya. They asked me the, something about Noah, how he was saved by works. And I went, no. Because before Noah ever received the instruction from God to build the ark, way before that, it says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Grace came first. Grace always comes first. Noah can't build the ark unless he has God's grace uh, put, establishing it in his mind, causing him to believe the warning that God gave and giving him and his three sons the ability to build the thing. Because nobody had ever built one before. He didn't download the blueprints off the internet. Uh, so anyway, uh, there, there are some who believe that our doctrine must only come from Romans through, let's see, Philemon, Philemon, Romans through Philemon, and that's it. Those are the letters that Paul wrote. Paul is the apostle for us Gentiles. Therefore, and his gospel was for us Gentiles, and Peter's gospel was for the Jews. It was a gospel of works. And I'm like, that's not what it says. And I've tried re reasoning with these people, and boy, I'll tell you what. If I ever want to be called a heretic, I just go try to reason with hyper-dispensationalists, because, man, they'll call me one very quickly. Did you find something, Melissa, to help me out here? Oh, great. I'm going to have to... I'm glad I got friends somewhere. <laughs> and the wall of the city had 12 foundations. Yeah, there it is. Had 12 foundations and in them the names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. I thought I read that somewhere. Thank you. All right. I must have read right through it. Didn't pay attention to it. All right. Anyway, um, and Christ now is the chief corner stone now i used to make a big to do about christ being the cornerstone because several years well in fact um between like 2000 2001 2002 2003 when i started doing presentations on the bible issue and so on at the time the new international version did not call jesus the corner stone they called him the capstone. Those are two different buildings and two different stones. Capstone is that top little pyramid that sits on top of a pyramid. The, the corner stone is like what you would see um, in some of, the, some of the older buildings where they had a cornerstone. Uh, if you go over to Main Street, where Commerce Bank used to be, it used to be right on Main Street, and there's a cornerstone there, I think. And... Um, it's probably a Masonic thing going on there because they always did cornerstone things, cornerstone blessings. But it's the stone that sets on the front corner and it establishes a right angle for the rest of the building. And if you don't get that stone, this is the, goes back to the day when these stones were not poured in concrete molds. They were literally were chiseled out by hand, uh, stone workers chiseling out stone which is an art that, man, I don't have it. But these, these stonemasons were so good because they had to be precise because they're the ones that built these big cathedrals all through Europe. And these things were huge and massive. And if their stones weren't cut right to the right angles and the right dimensions and everything like that, those buildings would have collapsed hundreds of years ago. So they set this cornerstone down and it sets a 90 degree angle for the rest of the building. You put that one down, and that has to be chiseled perfectly. It's called truing a stone in, in stonemason terms. So um, they would true the stone so that it was exactly 90 degrees. And they may have put one on each corner. I don't know. 
But that main cornerstone is what set the dimensions of the building. Okay? And that's what it's being referred to here. Christ is the chief corner stone in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord in whom ye also are builded together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. Now, uh, turn to uh, turn to First Peter. I do know this is there because I just read it. First Peter. Unless, of course, the Illuminati has taken it out of my Bible. Uh, bless her heart. I had a lady several years ago call me and she was she said she was enjoying the videos of me talking about how things have been removed out of the Bibles and so on and she agrees with me 100 percent and she talked to me for a while and Courtney she said that um, that in her case whoever it was had the ability to take words completely out of her printed Bible and I went well yeah I know that they Translations, they're gone. She said, no, no, my King James. She said, I'll read a verse, chapter one day, I go there some other day, and some of the words are gone. And I, I said, you mean they've been lifted off the page and they're not on the page anymore? She said, that's exactly what I'm saying. So I let her talk for a while and just to, and I asked her a few questions. I don't remember what I asked her, but I was just trying to get a sense of her mental fitness. And I finally, I, I was on it because I don't know her. And I thought, if she gets mad, she gets mad. But I told her, I said, ma'am, let me suggest something to you. She said, what? I said, let me suggest the idea that that's not really happening. I said, because number one, it would, well, it would, it would be God violating his word. When God said that he wouldn't let any of these words pass away, and yet in your copy of the King James, God is allowing, in, according to you, God is allowing words to be taken out. And I said, number two, that doesn't happen in reality. And I said, I don't know of any kind of science or any machine or any spirit that's ever lifted ink words off of a printed page. I mean, I'm trying to say it nice to her. I was trying to come up with a way to say, ma'am, you're crazy. You need help. Okay? And I don't have much success telling crazy people are crazy. But anyway, I finally said, ma'am, I'm going to suggest something to you that you take the Bible that you claim has words missing out of it to someone that you trust um, and maybe somebody in your family and tell them what you told me. In other words, find somebody that's well and get help. Okay, Tell them what you told me that way they can hear it for themselves and go, Grandma, are you okay? Or just something like that. I felt bad for her and I prayed for her when I got done. And I, fe I felt like an obligation to at least tell her, not, not pacify her fantasies or her uh, uh, delusions, but to get her to get somebody that could help her. Uh, but anyway, um, 1 Peter chapter 2, I like this. And I've, I've taught this before. I, one of the places that I taught it was up in... Um, um, I think it was Michi Lansing, Michigan. And there was a group of people there. They were Hebrew roots and sacred name people. And they were there trying to make proselytes into their cult. And they tried to trip me up with uh, the Easter word in Acts chapter 12. They tried to trip me up with that to make me admit that some words in the Bible were a mistake or to get me to admit that I was a secret pagan and I, you know, I worship bunnies. And uh, that, that's what they were trying to do. I promise you that's what they were trying to do. Because they showed me their sacred name Bible. I said, is that a King James? They said, well, it's based on the King James. Said, well, there's no such thing. But anyway, it was, they showed it to me. And it, they had taken Lord out and replaced it with all this stuff. Anyway, so when these guys tried to trip me up with Acts chapter 12, 
I got mad. And I thought, I'm going to go after these guys while they're sitting in the room and warn everybody not to follow them. And I said, let me tell you, there's a group of people in this room that when they go to bed tonight, they want to know that their Bible is the Word of God and that it's right so they can have comfort of Scriptures. Then there's another group of people in this room somewhere that wants to take that away from you and make you follow them instead of following the Word of God. Them. And I said, let me tell you what, let me tell you what they are. And so I opened up the first Peter chapter two. It says, um, verse four, to whom coming as unto a living stone. That's what our Bible is. It's not a dead book and it's not a, just a rock somewhere. It's a living stone. Christ is the living stone. The Bible is the living stone. Disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious. That's Proverbs, uh, seven, eight. I have written down in my Bible here. Um, verse 5, ye also as lively stones. Now we're included in this. Because the temple of God is not made of dead stones, is it? It's not made of rocks picked up from the ground. Or is it made of dead sinners? It's made of living stones and lively stones. So the foundation is the apostles and prophets, Christ the chief cornerstone, and the building is us. Amen. We're the, guess what we are? We're the pillars. Because Jesus said to one of the churches in uh, Revelation, to him that overcometh, will I grant him to be a pillar in my house. And I'm going, <gasps> he means it. It's not just a metaphor. He means it. So he said here, Ye as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. You believe in Christ, you hold on to this book, and God promises you, I'll never leave you in the dark. I'll never let you be confused. I will not send strong delusion to you that you'll believe a lie. I will not allow you to be deceived because you're the very elect. In verse 7, Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed. They kicked it out. What have they kicked out of the churches now? King James. The builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner, not the cap of the pyramid. The head of the corner. And a stone, oh, good grief. What did I say, how many degrees was in that right angle? Remember how many times the phrase house of God is mentioned? That just hit me. And you therefore which believe he is precious, but unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same as made the head of the corner, and a stone of stumbling, and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. So they're rejecting the King James. And their argument is, uh, there are no Greek and Hebrew manuscripts that are perfect. Therefore, there are no Bibles that can be perfect. And so because, because of that circular reasoning, they reject any Bible except the Bible that they come up with in their mind. And here it is right in front of them, but they kick it out. They say, well, we're not going to build our church on the King James. We're going to build it on having fun. We're going to build it on music. We're going to build it on light shows and fog machines and coffee shops and everything in the world except doctrine. We're going to build it with untempered mortar. We're going to build it on lies. So they build it on lies. And here, um, the stone of stumbling in verse 8 and a rock of offense, a uh, guy explained to me, and I like it. He said, there's stumbling, stone, and offensive verses in the Bible. To those who want to go through the Bible trying to find mistakes, God said, I'll let them find some. I'll make them think the Bible's full of it. 
to those who want to be offended by things like God hates sodomy, then they'll be offended at it. And because of that, they'll want to reject the Bible as being the sole source of God's inspiration to going after other alleged sources of inspiration and believe those things. And that's what's happened. Churches are built on things like this. Other alternate sources of inspiration and guidance, guidance rather than the Word of God, the King James, or anything like that. They absolutely refuse the truth and they want a lie. And so they stumble and they are offended. And when you stumble, you fall. And because they're not right with God, they remain fallen. All right, now back in Ephesians, very quickly, we'll finish this out. Uh, verse 21, in who, ver, chapter 2, verse 21, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto an holy temple in the Lord. The temple wasn't built in a day. They didn't bring in big prefabricated pieces and stick them all together and say, here are your temple. Um, it was built like the church was built, one stone at a time. And when, and only when, the last piece, which is the last soul to be saved, when that piece is brought in, it will be over. In other words, it will be now time to stop building it and start living in it. That's when Jesus will return. Okay? Um, and that's what it says. In whom, verse 22, In whom also you are built together for an habitation of God through the Spirit. So again, cry, and I still hear people talking about, oh, they're, they're so close to building the temple in Jerusalem. I mean, like they, they were going to start it last week. But I've heard that every year for the past 30 years, 40 years. Every year, they find some red heifer. Did you know they found a red heifer? Yeah, they did one last year too. And like the last 45 years, they found a red heifer. Red heifers and a peace agreements with the Muslims so they can have the Temple Mount and all kinds of stuff that people, this things that people prophesied 70, 80 years ago that have never been proven right, never come to pass. Um, they take the year that Israel was established as a nation, 1947, and they say a generation's 40 years, so sure enough, in 1987, Jesus is going to come back. Okay? He did, but it's very secretive. He only told like one guy, and his name was Sid. Okay? So Sid's dead now. But anyway... Uh, he didn't come back in 87. He, they said, no, no, no. It was 1948 that Israel was established. So he didn't come back in 1988 either. And so then they came up with different ways of trying to do the math. Oh, wait a minute. Wait a minute. It's, maybe it's 70 years. Yeah, that's it. 70 years. A generation, 70 years. Even though the Bible doesn't say that. Nowhere. It doesn't say it anywhere that a generation is a certain number of years. It's not 40. It's not 70 Nothing. Um, but that's what people read into it. And so they're going, okay, from 1947 to 70 years later would be... So what would that be? What was, that, what was the year then that he was going to come back? 40, so, so 2017. Didn't happen. 2018. Didn't happen. Meanwhile, you had the 2000, you had the 2012 people going nuts. You had the Y2K people going nuts. You had all these different groups taking all these random dates and adding 40 years or 70 years. And now it's probably some other number now because none of these ever come to pass. Or they'll try to tell you, well, we're in the tribulation right now. We just don't know it. No, you're not. Um, but people will always try to affix years and dates and so on to the Lord's coming and I did years ago I admit uh, and God kind of removed me away from it and um, but one of these days the last saint is 
going to be sanctified. The last Gentile is going to be called. And when that happens, the building will be accomplished. And even if the Jews build a temple in Jerusalem, a physical stone and gold and doorknobs building, Christ will not dwell in it. He does not dwell in temples made with hands. Uh, none of it. He is going to pitch his own dwelling place. And so that dwelling place will be the dwelling place of the saints. Um, next Sunday, if you look at verse 3 of chapter 3, uh, he mentions how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, as I wrote a four in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge of the, in the mystery of Christ. We're going to look at what that mystery is. It's several things, and if you'll just look at the word mystery or mysteries, it's all in the New Testament, uh, you'll get an idea then of what that mystery is all about. Um, the very first place it mentions it uh, is in, I think, Matthew, Matthew 13. And Jesus, he's teaching the parables about seeds in Matthew 13. And he says to his disciples, unto you it is given known, uh, it, unto you it is given to know the mystery of God or the mysteries of God. Uh, but to them that are without, it is not given. So part of the mystery or part of the understanding of the mystery is it's a, it's a general revelation of God's plan. In other words, when you read the Bible and as you're reading the Bible, believe it because that's what I'm going to do. It's re now revealed to you. It's revealed by the Gospels. It's revealed by Paul and Peter and James and John and Jude. And uh, it's revealed by those men to us in these days. It's a general revelation for all saints to know what the plan of God is. Because God's not going to do anything except he has revealed his secret to his servants and prophets. And those prophets are right here already revealed. We just have but to open it and read it and believe it. And it's that simple. Amen. Let's stand to our feet. Father, we thank you for revelation. We thank you, Lord, for revealing these things to us. And I thank you, God, that uh, the way the Bible is just simple, just believe it. And Father, there may be some things I don't understand, or I, I'll say, God, there's things that um, I can't see yet, but when I read them in the scriptures, I believe them. Father, I believe your word, and I believe that you have revealed these things to us who are undeserving, unworthy, we're the ignorant and unlearned men who have been with Jesus, and so we know that your word is true. And Father, help us not to boast, help us not to be prideful of what we believe and what Bible we have. Help us to be none of those things because we didn't do this. You did. You did it in us. And so, Lord, it was your calling and your election. Keep us safe throughout the week. Bless each and every one. And bless your word in our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.